Hello and welcome everyone to another market commentary here from Stashaway. With us as every week, our Chief Investment Officer, Freddie Lim. Hey, Freddie. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you holding up there at home? I'm working harder than before. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, what no most people do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read an article there. Uh, it's about people apparently working three hours more uh, per day now than if they would have been at the office. So um, <laughs> apparently it's true in your case. But um, all good. Um, we want to touch a few things, right? A uh, few updates um, as well as uh, got some interesting questions as well uh, from the audience as always. So for everyone, um, if you do have any questions for, you know, Freddie and myself, please leave them below this video in the comment box and um, the two of us will pick them up um, from week to week um, so we can answer them directly. So we'll get some direct engagement with us uh, by leaving your questions there in the comment box. Um, but let's get to it, Freddie. Um, we mentioned before the concept of the money multiplier, right? And, and we, we, we've been still getting quite a lot of questions because not the most straightforward thing to understand. Um, would you be able to, to go back to that and kind of explain to the people what it is and kind of why is it important to look at? Right. Um, as you knew, um, in the 1970s, our banking system is physically backed by gold. And the problem with that is that it's sort of like what, how many dollars is equivalent to one bar of gold physically backed. So that sort of limit your potential to, to grow. Because let's say economic activities are going up. A lot of people wanted to, to borrow money. Companies need to borrow money to expand. They couldn't really meet those demands on time. So we have moved away from the gold system to something backed by paper money. And under the so-called fiat paper system, we also operate on a fractional basis. What it means is that if there's $100 in the banking system, the banks collectively in the system do not have to hold $100 idle in the system. What they need to do by law is a required reserve ratio of some countries are 3%, some are 10%. But let's say it's 10%. $100, right? You will have $10 in reserve doing nothing. And the other 90, they can loan out. And somebody receiving the 90, assuming they put it into their bank account again, the banking system will have another $90 of new money supply and they will hold another $9 in reserve and lend out the other 81. And the process goes on and goes on until in this case, it goes up by 10 times more than the original banking system, right? And similarly, the reverse is true when money is lost or withdrawn from a system, it also multiplies. So everything is just more magnified in our modern banking system. Yeah, so, so when, when we look at that then, um, what do you say then to, to the FATS reduction, right? Um, of uh, the reserve requirements to almost zero now, right? Um, what's, your, what's your view on that then? It's really interesting because um, it, it just allows banks to not even hold any reserve and they are free to lend everything they can. So like this in, is the, in your case, it would be like the 100% then, right? <laughs> yeah, or infinity actually, right? Yes. In theory, theoretical maximum. Uh, so this is an effort for them to uh, increase the velocity of money at a time when we have the COVID-19 lockdown, at a time when the Fed is pumping massive amount of money into the system to make their impact even bigger than before. They are reducing the required reserve to zero, hence the money multiplier goes up and uh, that further compounding the benefits of what they have done to the markets. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But when, when you say to infinity and you know, we talked about the money multiplier in more detail, when it then comes to looking at an outlook, right? Uh, because especially you mentioned gold, right? You also, you know, obviously the US dollar is impacted by this if the Federal Reserve uh, goes with that policy. Um, what's your outlook then for those two uh, within the portfolio context? Well, when there's massive amount of money being printed and now multiplying more freely than before. <laughs> yes. So you, <laughs> you have a dilution of your purchasing power of paper money. So people who save and put cash in a the bank, they're going to get hurt. They're going to get diluted, uh, given and more and more so over time. And uh, people who keep um, uh, cash in the bank accounts are going to earn close to nothing in interest rates soon, right? So and what it means is that asset classes like uh, gold could do very well. 
First, it's known to, uh, to, it's very commonly known that gold has a negative correlation to US dollar in the absence of any other movement. So it is like a natural hedge for uh, paper money, right? Yeah. So it's understandable why gold can continue to go up in the medium term, for example. Yes. Same probably then, you know, but this is what they're trying to do, right? If you don't get anything in your savings account, that's what they've been saying since the global financial crisis, right? Because interest rates have been so low that people, especially retirees, they have to go way more out on the risk level, right? In order to sustain their spending, right? Uh, that they need or uh, the, the growth rate that they need to establish to not run out of money, right? Yes, but the way I see it, if I summarize it for investors, there can be two situations. We're in the face of a crash, right? So we try to recover. And so um, interest rate goes to zero, money multiplies like no tomorrow. And okay, so gold does well first. But what happens is if the Fed is successful at reflating and keeping the markets back on the man and the economy follows with a lack, of course, that what it means is that the cash is even more diluted because it's doing nothing, earning no interest. But at the same time, it may be further diluted by inflation coming back in, in a couple of years, right? Not today, but in a couple of years. So this really the worst strategy is to react to the negative news flow and stay cash in the bank account. You are going to get hurt anyway. Yes. You need to stay invested or you are better off spending the money. But obviously, I would recommend <laughs> yes. consumption. Right. Yes. No, no, no. I think that's a good balance to have there. Right. But uh, thanks, Freddy, for those updates. I think that's quite interesting um, uh, for people to understand, especially when it comes to the current climate and what they should be doing with their portfolio. Let's get to a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, first one is from CKL. He was asking, hey, Stashway team, um, thank you for the regular updates. Well, thank you for, for, for watching them. Right. Um, He's curious about country risks, right? So he's asking, for example, if um, let's say he has an 18% risk index portfolio, right? And it's made up of roughly, I think, 51% equities, of which 36% are concentrated in the US and 59 Europe, right? Is there any significant risk to focusing on these two regions? And or is there more optimal distribution after you guys considered more diversified allocations, right? Well, to do so, let me pull out a screen that will specifically show you the details about this particular portfolio, which is the 18% stash away risk index. So allow me to share a screen here now. Um, is it coming true to yep, you? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks, Freddy. So um, this other, actually the investable universe in stash away is, is wide. You don't see this all because in this portfolio, um, 18% is, sorry, it's right here. This column, you are seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight out of 33 items. So the algorithm over time, based on the, the leading economic indicators and the valuation in the markets, and among other factors, it would over time start moving um, among the 33 uh, uh, listed ETFs in this universe. But the user at any one point in time, in this case, saw only eight down there, eight ETFs, yeah. right? So it is a very diversified investable universe that you don't yet realize. And I think he's right. CK, I think K, CK is it? Um, yeah. That's 15% of European equities here. And if you add up the US component in sectors, that's 11 and 10 and 15 here, healthcare, healthcare, consumer discretionary and small cap mix up the other 36%. So he's, he's, he's on the ball on this. Now, if I move it down, actually the US exposure in this portfolio is not 36%, but actually 26.6 right here. And that's because some of the U.S. companies are very global uh, producers. They're very globally uh, diversified businesses, even though they are listed in the U.S. So accounting for that and also that gold, like I said earlier, is a natural insurance against money losing value. It is like a bit of a short on the U.S. dollar when you have gold. Accounting for gold, you sort of uh, brought that number down from 36 to 26 and a half. So you see the portfolio is actually a lot more diverse 
and rich in dynamics than uh, just, just adding up those numbers. And in this portfolio, you are investing in growth. So I think the user was saying there's 51% of uh, equities, stocks. Actually, we rather view, not all bonds are safe, right? Some bonds are also uh, growth oriented. So if you add up all the stuff that's growth related, it's actually 66.8%, not 51%. So and uh, just to look at the question again, the question is asking us, is there significant Whether, risks, right, to focusing just on those two regions? It's actually not true because yeah. um, geography diversification does not mean diversification because 96% of the time, um, they're all correlated. All the countries, national stock indices are correlated. You are better off by going into specific industry. Uh, in this case, in the U.S., you, uh, you were given three industry, uh, the small cap, the discretionary, which is Walmart and Amazon, and you have healthcare. That provided much more value in terms of diversification. And than actually by countries, right? Or by geographies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And the second re point is about currency, uh, and which is a, something we talk about quite a lot recently, is that we built in quite a number of safe haven and funding currency exposure. And in this case, there's quite a bit of US dollar exposure, 26.6% down here, right? This is to design to protect you from any systemic market meltdown that we have just seen this year. And for example, in the 2008 financial crisis, as you can see in the highlight I've, I've highlighted here, this portfolio will gain 2.3% just from currencies. And uh, when the dollar is, uh, and this year, I think that this, this portfolio gains about 4.8 percentage point in protection uh, from the COVID-19 simply because the dollar uh, appreciated against uh, most other currencies in tough times. So yeah. the diversification is achieved through sectors and current safe having currency ex uh, 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 insurance uh, in summary. That's what I would say. And no, I thank you, Freddie. Yeah, no, no, that, I think that was uh, super nice that you were able to share this and uh, show this on the screen for CK and everyone else because I think it's an interesting topic when we can fill out a whole hour to talk about diversification and uh, you know how to build these portfolios out. But that's for another time or if they want, they can always attend one of your um, advanced seminars on, on, on our investment framework as well. But uh, thank you, Freddie. Um, let's go with one more question before we wrap it up. Um, Eric Chang, he's asking us, right? Um, and it's probably something that's on a lot of people's minds is, uh, hi, we have witnessed a lot of market volatility lately. Um, and I know um, AUM is probably something which is closely guarded secret, uh, only open to, to our investors. Um, however, he was asking, can you give us, as, as a client, some indications if you've seen significant outflows of, uh, of, the, of Stash Away via redemptions? Um, and is your overall AUM growing or stagnant? Uh, he says I would give him some good assurances that his investments have I, uh, low risk of liquidation. I will give you the conclusion first. Yeah. Before I give, uh, sort of uh, give a bit more color. Yeah. Um, in summary, we saw net strong growth during first quarter 2020, which is a period that covers the February, the, the 19th Feb to 23rd March uh, market crash. As of 31st March, our net deposits have grown 47% from December 31st, 2019. So that is actually a real, realized number for the quarter. If I break it down within the quarter, and obviously in the middle of the crash, in the first maybe first two weeks of the crash, by sure reason of market dropping, the value market value of portfolios came down. Obviously, AUM would drop based on that at first, right? And so, but overall, uh, we rebounded strongly after the initial phases, and to close the quarter with a forty-seven percent increase in net deposits for Q1 2020. Thank you, Freddie. And I think, you know, that really underscores also, you know, people, some people taking advantage of lower markets, right? Uh, I think we can certainly see that from, from some investor behavior, right? Uh, especially on the high net worth side, people are, you know, we're saying, hey, this is a, you know, a nice quick pullback almost, right? Like things are really on sale. Um, so getting a good into, into Stashway, into, the, uh, into our platform. Um, for that reason as well, especially if a lot of people had money parked in uh, Stashway Simple as well, right? And now that yes. you can, you know, move money directly from Simple into your portfolios, it makes it quite easy. 
um, to, to dollar cost average into the market there as well. I think you're exactly right. I think um, the reason the numbers are so strong, even amid the market volatility, is because the platform is very holistic. Uh, you have people looking at generating income. You have people looking at long-term uh, financial plan using our core portfolios. You also have people looking to manage their cash. And people who doesn't necessarily want to be in the market would have the cash uh, product to look at, right? So that's the end result of how we design the platform. So it's been strong. We had a good quarter. Yes, exactly. And that's, I think, hopefully reassuring for Eric and uh, everyone else that's, that was, um, you know, looking at that. Um, so let's go uh, with that. Thank you so much, Freddie. Uh, before I wrap it up here, I just want to let everyone know that we still have uh, a couple of uh, seminars coming up here. Um, one of them is going to be in Malaysia uh, on the 6th of May. Um, 2020 at 6 p.m. We'll talk about personal finance basics. You can find out more about that one um, in, by going through one of the links below um, this video. And as always, please feel free to, to uh, leave comments, feedback for Freddie and myself. What can we do better? Um, any questions you have that you want us to pick up? Uh, we're really looking forward to that. We always want to get better. Um, so that's with that. Otherwise, we wish everyone a wonderful rest of your week, a long holiday weekend ahead as well. And uh, we all be with you again next week. Bye bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the StashAway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.